How you doing guys? This is Eric from RuleTheWasteland.com. Recently I was able to meet with David the Good, author of two of the best survival gardening books that are out there, which is Compost Everything and Grow or Die. And I got a chance to go down and meet with him because I found out he lived just a few miles away from me, about 40 miles away. So we got to do a great long kind of freeform interview where we talked about a lot of different stuff. I'll probably be breaking it up into multiple segments, so to stay tuned to this channel. But check out his books on Amazon, the links will be in the description, and his website, thesurvivalgardener.com, and enjoy the interview. This is Eric with RuleTheWasteland.com, and I'm here with David the Good. How you doing? Doing very nice good. Nice to finally meet you in person. Yeah, it's great. Found out you lived just, actually just about 40 miles away from me, in this undisclosed secret location. Right, right. In uh, North Central Florida. And I subscribe to your channel back in spring of last year after you did the uh, compost everything review. It's like, hey, the guy reviewed compost everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. And that's what we're here to talk about today. He's got a couple good books out about gardening for a specifically related to preparedness and homesteading and things like that. So what got you into just gardening in general, specifically into like with an, with an eye towards preparedness? Were those like two separate things that eventually merged or was it always? Yeah, there were two separate things that, that merged. I was a, I was a hobby gardener. Like I, I started gardening when I was six. I just got the bug when I saw the first time I saw a bean sprout. I was like, I can't believe this happened. Like you stick it in there and then it opens up and leaves come out of it. And it's like I was the same way. No way. <laughs> my parents made fun of me because of my I said my first pet was a pet carrot. Yeah, like, yeah, chop exactly. the top off, put it in the water, and then my aunt let it die, and I was like devastated. But. <laughs> And then, yeah, I mean, it's it's horrifying. Right. <laughs> you know, you have the little grave in the backyard, little tiny exactly. carrot grave. But know. it feels like you're getting, to me, it was always about, it feels like you're getting almost like something for nothing. If you can grow something. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just like you've got the dirt, you've got seeds, and you get, like, free food I mean, out how, of it. How, how many seeds come inside of a watermelon? I mean, like, hundreds of seeds in right. a watermelon. Watermelon sells for, like, five bucks. I mean, this is, there's literally, like, $500 worth of watermelons inside of one watermelon. Right, if you, you know, can make it happen. That's not bad. No, it's a pretty good return on investment. <laughs> five, one, no, no, hundred. No, never mind. I know. I totally did the math wrong on that. Yeah, something like Fifty thousand million <laughs> dollars worth of watermelons of seeds of that in one. there. So the first question is: Are you upset that your name isn't Greatman? Because then it could be the Great Guide. Yeah, yeah. That that actually, I, I played awake at night <laughs> yeah, worrying like... about that. I I used to have a boss. You know, the last name is Goodman, and uh, he was a Calvinist, so he would call me uh, David Depravedman. Depravedman. Okay, thanks. That's that's good. I like that. Yeah, you're like I'm not in the predestination thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> but if he is, it wasn't your fault. But I, I, I didn't. I, I, I was made this way. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't even pick my name. <laughs> right, it's predetermined. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I I um I got into gardening and just loved gardening and I had all kinds of little gardens. I grew a bunch of you know when I was a kid, all like little terrible looking cucumbers and, and right. pathetic lettuces <laughs> and stuff, you know, and, vegetables. and I, like, I got better and better over the years. And, you know, then after I got married and had kids and around the same time, I started really getting heavy into economics back in the early to mid 2000s. I started reading economics and reading about inflation, reading about the Federal Reserve and, right. and I'm going, wow, everything's really a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think this gardening thing is probably, I, I, I'm just going to determine to have enough food in the ground that we're at least, we can go a few months, you know, and so, but, but then I had to really think differently because I always had the small little garden that was nice and I had this and that going. I, I just started getting long term and I started reading people that were planting trees and it's like I never wanted to do a tree I wanted to do radishes because radishes were ready in 28 days right like, I don't want to wait three four years. or five yeah I mean <laughs> I like, I don't, a, a tree, for goodness sakes. See, I was always lazy. So to, to me, the trees were like amazing because like you plant it once, if it takes, if it's and it's indigenous to the area, you get like every year, this fruit comes off it for years. Right. So if, to me, that was always like, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should have thought that way when I was younger, but um, I started picking up on the trees and the shrubs and the, you know, the perennial stuff. And then my gardens got bigger. And after we had kids, um, you know, we, we grew more and more groceries every year to the point where we right. don't really have to buy vegetables. That's anymore. awesome. You know, yeah. We buy food, fruits here and there, but even that. And now you're talking at a point much. where when you get to replace a significant amount of your food, like even if nothing ever goes super bad, like things are getting more expensive, especially food related. So, I mean, you can at least save a bunch of uh, money that way. Right, right, totally. Which is super helpful. Totally. So with an eye towards preparedness, what do you do differently versus just a hobby gardener? Like what are the big differences between specifically like a survival gardening versus just gardening? The average gardener concentrates on a few crops that they really like. 
like uh, you know, so and so really loves their hot peppers. Or they want to make salsa. I have right. a salsa garden with tomatoes, cilantro, and peppers. Well, that's that's going to feed you for about five minutes. Right. I mean, it's it's great. <laughs> I mean, that's that's good to be gardening, but but generally, I mean, that sort of thing. Or, or you know, I, I want to grow a bunch of lettuces. Well, lettuces have almost zero calories. Right. I mean, they're nice. But it's but, not nutritious, really, for terms of sustaining you. Right. Exactly. So so I would concentrate first on caloric density for the space and secondarily on nutritional density for the space and um, then third I, I would try to pick the things uh, if I couldn't do this first you know the things right. that were the absolute easiest to grow with the least amount of irrigation and least amount of work right. like in our climate you know people always complain about how hard it is to grow tomatoes or then you'll have somebody who says it's not hard to grow tomatoes all I do is I start them in February and I bring them inside and then I put them outside and I put a mason jar over each one and then I put them over on for the cutworms and I give them fish emulsion and you've got to put them in perfect soil. I'm like, no, that, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to go like this, pop, put it in the ground and then water it when I think about it and then have tomatoes. And, and tomatoes don't work that way. You right. know? Well, and, that's something that I've mentioned to people too is that when you talk about actually being prepared, sometimes if you still have to go to the store to buy stuff for your chickens or your tomatoes right you're not really and you're still just one disaster away from not being able to support the tomatoes instead of you know you might as well just buy something that's already in a can and store yeah, it that exactly way. just just pile it up if you can't yeah if you can't sustain <laughs> it yourself without going to the store then what's the difference really yeah and that's that's partly why I wrote the compost everything book was everybody will tell you how to fertilize your garden organically but how do you fertilize the garden organically if you can't go to the store yeah, and you're buy all these expensive. Organic, yeah. you know, I'm going to go buy blood meal, which was shipped in from you know some slaughterhouse, you know, <laughs> a thousand miles away. I'm going to buy some fish emulsion right. from the California coast. Like that's why I originally got experimenting with the aquaponics because I was like, okay, here's a closed system, which right, is fun, but loop. you still have to have a power source then for it, which is another issue. You it's know what I mean? Issue. It was a fun yeah. experiment. But uh, I, de I definitely got getting away from that because of it. You're still. And people connected. tell you, well, you can do solar panels. I'm like, yeah, but what happens if the solar panels break? Right. What happens if you have an EMP? Right. I mean, it's great, but it wouldn't be my primary system. No. I say set up a system like that after you know how to take your front lawn, tear it up, and grow right. enough to eat. Just you pretty know? much do whatever you want. Yeah. Right. So what basically? What are the? Because I don't think a lot of people know like the true capability of having. Because you don't have like 30 acres here. Right, you know what I mean. You still said you're, yeah, one acre, and you're still making enough food that you can like significantly uh, subsidize your guys' like meals. So, what is the real capability of like a properly structured kind of food forest or like homestead type gardening? If you're oh, in like a climate like this, obviously different climates are going to be different, but it's way beyond what people think you can do. Because I've heard figures like it takes six acres to support one person year round with conventional farming technology, and I've seen people. You know, with different videos of you know micro homesteads on a quarter of an acre producing thousands of pounds of food a year, if you do it right. Yeah, we did. We did 966 pounds out of the gardens this year, this this last year in 2015. Wow. And 966 pounds is nothing compared to the capability of this right. ground. And that's I'm not even using most of three it. Three pounds a day of food. Right. It was you know great. I mean? It yeah. was it was it was enough that we didn't have to buy the vegetables. So that was that was cool. Um, right. What what we found is. I mean, I, I like the, the permaculture folks with their stacking functions. So you might have something that's edible, but it can also be cut down at the end of the year to be turned into compost. Or biomass or something, yeah. It might also be a nitrogen fixer, so it's adding nitrogen into the soil. You know, so you've got something like pigeon peas. Mm -hmm. You know, you can eat the, the little pigeon peas as a pea, but they don't make a whole ton of food, but it's some food. But the plant gets to be about six foot tall, and it's got a pretty decent hard wood, so you could chop that wood use that wood in your biomass cook stove right. you know, to cook with or to heat. And it's also setting nitrogen beneath the ground at the same time. So it's fertilizing whatever lousy soil that you have there. The next year you could plant something more needy. And you can also take the whole top of that thing off and compost it. So you've got right. like four uses for one Yeah, instead of fighting, plant. fighting, fighting to keep some sort of plant alive, like just year round the same thing in the same spot, you know, using different plants right. that are natural to the area and right. grow well. Right, and then you look you look up too. It's like we've got oak trees up here. Right. You know, if if you had uh, pecan trees up here and then beneath them you've got mulberries and you've got citrus around those. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, blueberries, thornless blackberries, gumi berries. This is a uh, autumn olive, a nitrogen fixing edible 
Some kind of berry. olive, is that what you said? Oh, it's, it's called just... autumn olive because it looks like an olive. But they're a berry. But they're a berry and they're also a nitrogen fixer. They make these big colonies of nitrogen fixing bacteria that live on the roots of those things. Perfect. So this was lousy soil, so I stuck an autumn olive in here. Yeah. So you, you keep going down in layers, then you get down to your, you know, your, your herbs and shrubs, layers, and then you got roots beneath the ground, and then right. you plant vines that climb up through that whole thing, and those are edible too. So you're looking at instead of uh, you know, 20 square foot of cabbages, you know, you may have like a tree with more, with more, with more, with more, kind of like an open wood right. type of a thing. And no, if there's something that grows in the area, it takes less work than picking weeds out everywhere and stuff between like one little patch of something right. that's not you, native to the area. Once it, once the system actually takes off, the whole thing flies. 